appreciate you, Brother Reg. Love you. I, uh, I promise you, I've already paid the price for this message. Um, some of you that follow uh, us and always try to tell what's going on, uh, important things with our church and, and our family. And uh, I've sat down with my, with my kids several times, they're all adults now, and say, look, you guys probably need to move a thousand miles away from me because every time the devil gets mad at me, he don't take it out on me, he takes it out on them, takes it out on, their, on my grandchildren, and I've got 16 grandchildren. Amen. And all three of my daughters work for me, and my daughter-in-law works for me. So I, there are all of them there every day. And the first thing they know to do, when I get my coffee, they come to my office and get my candy. And it's twice a day they get candy every day from me. They know that. And then I get rid of them. I ain't got time for you anymore. But anyway, it's a joy. And... Um, a couple weeks ago, weekends ago, um, I've got my one of my youngest granddaughters uh, born from my son. Uh, they've diagnosed her with cerebral palsy, and she's doing she's doing well. She's learned how to walk pretty good, and she has got the, she has got that Gerber baby look about her, just as sweet as pie. And uh, she had just been in the hospital. And then my youngest daughter, Courtney, was uh, trying to clean the house late one evening. And she was holding her newborn, Judah, and fell. And she heard his head hit the kitchen floor. And that was, that's still, you pray for her. It's still hard to get over that. Um, but it did fracture, put a little fracture in his skull. But after a couple of days, swelling went down. He's just got the prettiest smile in the world. Uh, but then Saturday night, uh, 11.30, my son called uh, my wife. And I don't usually have my phone on at night. Had he called my phone, we wouldn't have heard it. But my wife's phone was on. He called her. And we're kind of used to that because things between the two youngest, between the two granddaughters that he has, they both have illnesses and they both have seizures. And the three-year-old Reagan, which I like that, Reagan Hoggard. It sounds like I was on the ticket with Reagan running for president. <laughs> Reagan Hoggard. Um, but anyway, she, she um, had a seizure. And my son fell asleep on the couch that night. God woke him up at 11.30. To her, he could hear her gurgling. She was laying in the floor next to him, belly down, but her head was turned out. There was a little pool of vomit there. And she, had, she was in full seizure. And they called the ambulance. And I'm telling you, that ambulance, God bless them because they got there, and within two or three minutes, they assessed her, scooped her up, got her in the ambulance, down to the... I followed my wife on Live 360. My wife was doing 80 down the road trying to keep up the ambulance and couldn't keep up with the ambulance. And um, so other than that, my wife would be here today. We would have pulled in in our big old RV that we've been living in for the last three months, well, since February 16th when our house caught on fire. And, um, but she, she needs to stay there with our daughter-in-law and she's probably up at the hospital today. So uh, I t I've already taken the whipping. When I preach on this Bible, I'll get beat up over it. And it's not men, okay? It's not men, it's principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. And the only thing that I know to do is what David did in the Psalms. He cried out unto the Lord. I cried unto the Lord and God heard me. And uh, I don't believe you say magic words with God. I don't believe you can say words that will invoke God. I think God's our Father and all you got to do is scream help. Amen. And he's there for you. Amen. 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 Um, tell you what I'm going to do since I've got a little time. 
Uh, I want to show you a couple neat things. I, I had this on a PowerPoint, but I didn't just think of adding it to it uh, until just a few minutes ago. But let me let me give you some neat things that I like. I like to find the cool things from the Bible, the neat old things, and we'll use that then to get people's attention. And that then reaches them. We've got several people here that are from, you let people from Georgia come up. What were you thinking? <laughs> but anyway, um, those things I've found will get people's attention. And then when they start hearing the Word of God, the Word of God does what the Word of God does. I don't have to do anything but give them the Word of God. And the Word of God makes a difference in their life. I remember I got an email from a guy one time, and he said, you don't know me. He said, but I'm going to tell you something. He said, I was lost. I was in sin. He said, I grew up Roman Catholic. And he said, I was kind of Catholic during those old days. He said, I'm retired. I'm single. And he said, I went to the laundromat one day to, to wash my clothes. And there on the folding table, Somebody had put these DVDs all on the table. I didn't know what they were, so he said he's folding my clothes. He looked down there and sees something with DNA on it, Mike Hoggard, and he looks at it, and he's folding his clothes, and he, he looks at, there's different titles on there, so he grabs one, puts it on his clothes, drives back to his uh, apartment, and puts his clothes away, sits down, turns the DVD player on, and watches that video. Was so impressed, so blessed, he went back to the laundromat to get the rest of them off the table and he binge watched me for I don't know probably eight to ten hours and he told me he said brother Mike I just wanted you to know I got saved and he said I went out and bought a King James Bible the next day that's that's King James Bible saved amen and see I didn't do that I didn't do that what am I doing wrong need to fix your wire I'm gonna stand real still yeah. <laughs> You're telling me I got problems? <laughs> you know. Go ahead and check it. Hello? Get a roll of duct tape, wrap it around my ear. <laughs> What's that? Check one, two. All right, praise the Lord. So anyway, that's just what I like to do. Um, so here's what I want you to do. I want you, I want you to think about this now for a second. Uh, I did a, I do, I teach on numbers. I love to study numbers in the Bible. The numbers will tell you things just like other types and symbols and shadows in the Bible will tell you. Pay attention to the numbers. Learn the numbers uh, like the number seven, the number six. When you find out what six means, you'll understand 666 better yeah. and different things like that. And uh, I started seeing things in the Bible. I count stuff in the Bible. I started seeing things that were significant that were in groups of 66. Let me give you an example. Example, if you take your Bible and turn to Luke chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, this is beautiful. I love this. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus has been in the wilderness now fasting and for 40 days. He's endured the temptation from Satan. He's uh, given him the word of God, told him to go on his way. Satan left him for a season. Now Jesus comes down and he comes in the power of God. And if you remember the story, he goes to Nazareth, verse 16, and his custom was to go into the synagogue. And when he went into the synagogue, verse 16 tells us that he stood up for to read. He's going to do the reading of the Word of God. In verse 17, there was delivered unto him the book. Now think of the book. You're holding the book in your hand. Amen. Amen. It is the book. It is the Word of God, the book. There was handed to him the book of the prophet Isaiah. Now that's Isaiah. How many chapters does Isaiah have? 66. So he is holding a type of the entire Word of God in his hand. 66 books in our Bible. So, 66 chapters in Isaiah, and he opens up to a certain place, and it, he found the place where it was written. In verse 18, 
The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now you do this on your own time. Make a note. And I want you to count, starting in verse 18, every, you don't do it now, but every word that Jesus said in verse 18, verse 19, and then what he said in verse 21, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now remember, he's reading from Isaiah with 66 chapters, which is a type of the book that you have that has 66 books in it. And if you count the number of words that he spoke here in your King James Bible, he spoke exactly 66 words. Amen. I think that's better than amen. I think that's, woo, amen. Amen. All right. Uh, let me give you another one here. In Exodus 33, how old was Jesus? 33. In Exodus 33, Moses wants to see God. No man can see God and live. So he puts him in the cleft of the rock and he says, I'm going to pass by you, Moses. And God showed him what? His back, his spine. Yeah. You know how many bones you have in your spine? 33. Amen. 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 Now watch this. In your spine, now this is beautiful. The head in the body temple, in the typology of the body, the head is Christ. Yeah, that's right. Everything from here down is us, the body. That reminds me of my first job after I got married. I got married, went into drywall and painting and thought I knew everything. And my boss said, Hoggard, I hired you from here down. <laughs> Don't think. I'll do the thinking. He said, Hoggard, have you ever heard of the golden rule? I said, well, yeah, I think so. He said, if it's my gold, I rule. <laughs> He's right. So I quit thinking for a long time. But anyway... Here's the head. This is the body. How does the head communicate with the body? The brain sends signals down the spinal cord. Yep. At each vertebra in your, in your back, there are two bundles of nerves. A bundle of nerves that goes out the left side, a bundle of nerves that goes out the right side. Now, if you were to do the math, 33 times those two bundles is what? That's how the head speaks to the body Amen. through the 66. Amen. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to augment that a little bit because the bottom four of your vertebra, which is your tailbone, it, actually it's the um, sacrum. The sacrum is where the spine, the spinal cord stops. The sacrum is a picture of hell. There's no word of God in hell. Everybody that's down there has rejected the word of God. Amen? Amen. So I was originally wrong about my numbering of that. I thought 33 spines times 2 is 66. But then I did more study. And I found out that there's four more sets of nerves, groups of nerves, that come directly from the brain down into the body that don't use the spinal cord as their way. Two of those are called the vagus nerves. Anybody ever heard of those? And what do the vagus nerves do? They go from the brain and they connect, huh? Use your hand, just crank it right up into your face to use that one. All right. Or you can, you can put it on the stand if you want. There we go. All right. I'll hold it. So to replace the four that you don't have on the bottom of your spine, God put four more directly from the brain down into the body.
Think of the four Gospels and who did God send down directly from heaven yeah. to speak to his body? Christ. Jesus Christ in four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Yeah. Two of those are the vagus nerves. And the vagus nerves come down from the brain. I think a, a pair controls your neck movement and different other things. But they, they connect your heart to your stomach. Ladies, the way to a man's heart... See, God came up with that. Amen? Amen? The heart, the stomach, the bowels. This is why the Apostle Paul said, have bowels of mercy. They connect our organs, our bowels, our stomach, our heart, our lungs to the brain. This is why when we get angry or we feel emotions like love or passion or anything like that or sadness... Sadness comes from the brain and it sends signals down to our heart. Our heart beats fast or sometimes slows down. We start breathing hard. This, this, whoever is, who's a cop? Anybody a cop here? Cops can read these guys who've got methamphetamine in the back of their car. All they have to do is watch their hands. They're shaking and they can see those, that blood vein just popping out of their, they can tell that they're lying because it affects the rest of their body. And oftentimes when somebody's scared enough, they'll say, I got to go to the bathroom. I got to go right now. And that's because of those two vagus nerves that come right down from the head, right down to the body. So God still talks to the body through the 66 nerves that he sends down into the body. And it's no different than it is this church body, my church body, any other church's body, God is going to speak to that church from the head through the 66 books of the Bible. Amen? I got another one for you. In the wilderness tabernacle, God instructed Moses how to build everything in that thing. So Moses is going to build the candlestick. And God told him, see that thou doest exactly the way from the pattern that I showed you in heaven. God showed him the candlestick up in heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So it had to be done exactly the way he saw it. So in the candlestick, the candlestick looks like a tree. It looks like an almond tree. Because it has six, three branches on the left side, three branches on the right side, and it has a main trunk branch in the middle. Now, God told Moses, Moses, on these three outer branches on the left side, I want you to put three sets of decorations. And each set of decorations has three smaller pieces to it. A knop, a bud, and a flower from an almond tree. So let's say on that outer pipe, you have a knop, a bud, a flower, a knop, a bud, a flower, a knop, a bud, and a flower. So on the outer pipe, you have three, six, nine decorations. Okay? Do the math. So on the first three limbs of the candlestick, you have 9, 18, 27 decorations on one side. From the middle, the middle had four sets of three decorations. So you have 3, 6, 9, 12 in the middle. Then on the right side, right side you, you go back to the threes again. You have 369, 369, 369. 9 plus 9 is 18, plus 9 is 27. Which means that on the left side of that lamp, that candlestick, including the middle branch, you've got 39 decorations on one side and 27 on the other. How many? 66. God was showing us all the way back in Moses how he was going to light our path. Amen. And light the inside of us, his body, his temple. The only light allowed in there was the candlestick with the 66 decorations on it. Amen. <laughs> I'll give you one more, and then I'll get on to the other stuff, all right? How many teeth do you have? Wait a minute. Who still got theirs? You know, I don't care if you bought them. You still have them, amen? 
The human adult has 32 teeth. The teeth and the tongue work together to form the words that every language on earth is made of. So 32 teeth and a tongue is how much? Contained by two lips, which is the Old and New Testament. Okay? But out of the mouth of one witness, nothing can be done. Out of the mouth of two witnesses, or three, let every word be established. So 33, 32 teeth and a tongue here, 32 teeth and a tongue here. How many is that? Out of the two witnesses of your Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. Somebody say amen. 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 Mm, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Amen. amen. All right. Now you like me. <laughs> See, I'm dealing, I had to, I'm dealing with several things coming down here. I was not, it was my birthday yesterday, dementia setting in already. And I was worried about my granddaughter. And I, I, I preached this message probably 20 times to the congregation of my mind. And all 20 times I was getting thrown out. So I don't know who's here. I don't know if all of you, if we're all of the same mind or not. But I know that once I preach this here, then I'm going to take what I'm recording, and I'm going to go back, and I'm going to edit it, and I'm going to put it online. And I want some preachers to watch it. I want some pastors to watch it. Pastors who were like me years ago. So I'll tell you a little bit about my story. Uh, I grew up in the church that I've been pastoring now since 1996. My mom started going there. A neighbor invited us. 1974, we started going there. And I liked it because there was the building dedication service for the new building this church had just built. And I liked it because they had singing and fried chicken. And I thought, Mom, I like this church. <laughs> so we've been going there all, all my life practically. And I heard nothing but, this is the 70s, into the 80s, I hear nothing but preachers preaching out of a King James Bible. Yeah. Hey. When I was a teenager, me and some other families in our church, we started reading some of the Jack Chick literature on the King James. And I was going, yeah, that, that King James, them other Bibles are different. And then I went to Bible college. You weren't there, don't I owe me. <laughs> No, you're right. Because the one thing that they did was take away the infallible inerrancy of the current Bible that we have. I heard Greek text. I heard textual variants. I heard all of those arguments. And I believed him. Because I wanted people to like me. Yeah, man. That's right. I wanted people to like me. I, so, and I wanted to fit in. So that's how I did it. So by my junior year, they elected me student body chaplain. So just as a gag, I went out and bought a Catholic priest shirt. And would wear it around campus every now and then. So everybody called me Father Hoggard. <laughs> so... I get out of Bible college, I marry my wife, and we were married a few years, and I thought I would buy her a present, and I bought her uh, a woman's study Bible, life application study Bible, and it was an NIV. And she took one look at it and said, I don't like it. I spent 50 bucks on that. <laughs> Well, I don't care, I don't like it. My wife doesn't hold back and perfume some of her words. <laughs> so that kind of made me mad. But I was in the wilderness during those times. 1996, I became pastor of Bethel Church under some very unusual, bad circumstances. I don't talk about it much. But the moment I stepped in that pastor's office, God took a rod to me 
he beat me. I didn't think I was going to live through it, honestly. A year later, 1997, God's faithful. Amen. Even when we're not, God is faithful. Yeah. So, thank you, appreciate that. Um, God long suffered with me. God reminded me of all my sins, chastened me over it. And what that meant to me, and I didn't realize it at the time, but what that meant to me was he was showing me I was his son. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. And I'm glad he did. Amen. So 1997, it's kind of like what Brother Reg said. I didn't hear an audible voice, but the Holy Ghost moved me and said, we're going to study Bible prophecy. Now, I love to study Bible prophecy. And I did. I said, I'm going to go out and buy some. There's some new books out at the bookstore. I'm going to go buy them. I'm going to read them. And then I'll know all about prophecy. And God said, Mike, I wrote one. Yeah. Amen. 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 yeah, I never thought of it that way. But he did. So I said, God, fine. Where do you want me to start? Old uh, Daniel or Revelation? Mike, open it up and start reading. Seek you out the book of the Lord and read. Amen. So God had given us peace in our church and made things easy for me those first few years. And I just read and read and read and read and read. And finally, God began to connect things. Now, I was reading a King James, but I still had not made that, that cross back over. I didn't cross back over to the King James. And I had a guy in my church that was just begging me to stick with the King James. And I, and I told him, look, I've heard all the arguments. You're not going to win with me. And folks, let me tell you, I cannot change your mind on the Bible issue. I can't. But I know the one who can. Okay? And he's got a big rod that he'll use, but he's going to get your attention. And that's how God did it. God got my attention. And just one day I was in my office and I was doing what the scripture says. I was thinking on these things, meditating on the word of God. And finally the Holy Ghost said, Mike, you know that King James Bible is right. And at that exact moment, the white flag came out. I surrendered and I believed it. Instantaneously, I believed it. Now, again... I go back to, I knew all the arguments on both sides. So I said, God, I, I don't, I don't want to be a Greek text expert. I don't want to be anything like that. I believe you told me this Bible was right. Show me in this Bible that it's right. Yeah. So I want to run through some things and Part of what I'm going to do is I'm going to be mean for a minute. Amen. You ain't heard what I'm going to say yet. <laughs> I'm going to read the verses. I know they're kind of light, but I'll read them to you. 2 Corinthians 2, 17, 4. We are not as many which corrupt the word of God. Now raise your hand if you believe that. Amen. Okay? And, and what I'm going to do is I decided to do this in, in an open Forum. If at any time you have a question for me, raise your hand. Now, I'm not a debater. I'm not a fighter. But I will give you my best biblical answer to your question. Because if I can't answer the question with Bible verses, then... Nothing I say is going to change your mind. Yeah. Only the Word of God. Amen. So let me read this again. For we are not as many which corrupt the Word of God. Yeah. Again, raise your hand if you believe that. Raise your hand. Yeah. Okay. Here's another one. 1 Timothy 3.16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Raise your hand if you believe that. Amen. Isaiah 14, 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Now raise your hand if you believe that that is Satan. Okay. 
Luke 4.4, 4, and Jesus answered him saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Raise your hand if you believe that verse. Amen. 1 John 4, 3, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, where if you've heard that it should come, and now already is it in the world. Raise your hand if you believe that verse. Amen. Matthew 17, 21, Howbeit this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Amen. Mark 9, 29, He saith unto them, This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Amen. Matthew 18, 11, For the Son of Man has come to save that which is lost. Raise your hand if you believe that verse. Amen. Matthew 23, 14, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore you shall receive the greater damnation. Do you believe that verse? Amen. Mark 11, 26, But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. Do you believe that one? Yeah. Acts 8, 37, This is the Ethiopian eunuch. And in verse 36, He's already been, he's already been read uh, Isaiah 53. He found out that Isaiah was not speaking of himself. He was speaking of Christ. And Philip was there to show him that. And Philip said, the, the eunuch said in the verse before, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Raise your hand if you believe that. Amen. Uh, that got it in there twice. Daniel 3.25, he entered and it said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Mwanawamungu. That's Swahili for Son of God. Amen. Amen. Raise your hand if you believe that he was the Son of God in the fiery furnace. Amen. Now, is there anybody here that would be truthful enough to say, uh, there were some verses up there that I don't believe should be there. Is there anybody? And I'm not trying, I won't make fun of you, I won't call you out. So I'm going to say this. I think pretty much everybody was raising their hands. But if you read, study, preach from any other English translation of the Bible other than the King James, and you said you believe these verses, you're a liar. Amen. That's right. Amen. That's right. That's right. You're a liar. Yep. You lied in the house of God. Now, nobody raised their hand and said, there's some verses up there that I don't believe should be in there. Because all of those verses that I just read to you yep. are either completely omitted yep. or they have been significantly altered. Yep. And let me tell you how I presented it to the Kenyans in, in um, Kilimambogo. And I've been setting them up all week for this one thing. <laughs> I told them, I said, I learned some Swahili last night. And they were excited about that. I said, Moana Wamungu. And they said, Son of God. I said, yeah, that's what it means. I said, did I say it right? Moana Wamungu? They said, yeah, Moana Wamungu. So he's the Son of God. I said, Jesus is the Moana Wamungu. And they said, amen. And they got up and danced a little bit. <laughs> you should have, Brother Red, you should have seen. It was me and Mike Hudson and another preacher with all these Africans in church. And boy, they're just, man, they're doing it. We're standing there like secret service agents. <laughs> so then I said, um, with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who was in the fiery furnace? The Moana Wamiungu. And they went, no. I said, what, what did I say? 
Miungu instead of Mungu means gods, plural. They said, you said son of gods. I said, well, that's not right, is it? And they said, no. I said, now turn to Daniel 3.25 in your Swahili Bible. And they read it and they wept. Because the Catholic Church got involved in the Swahili Bible translation years ago and changed it. And the pastor of the church stood up and you, I just never know how this is going to be received. And he held up his hands. He said, I've heard enough. And I went, man, I'm fixing to have to call the UN here to send a helicopter after me. <laughs> and he said, I realize I've been preaching out of a book, but I've not been preaching from the Word of God. Amen. And we had boxes of King James Bibles. We got, and we got rid of every one of them there. Amen. You see, you know what God did for those people? God sent... British ships to East Africa years ago and they colonized East Africa and with it they brought tea and the Kenyans take their tea like British people do twice a day with milk and everything and they play football which is soccer and they do all of those things that, that the British people left behind but they also know how to read and speak English. Amen. But for some strange reason, they think I have an accent. <laughs> and I told them that. I said, God in his divine providence wanted you people out here to be able to read his perfect word in English. And that's why God sent the English here to leave the language behind so you could read the right Bible. Amen. Now again, God dealt with me on this issue several years ago and just basically said, Mike, that Bible's right. So I said, God, give me evidence then. And part of that evidence was looking at the major verses. I mean, here's another one. I don't know if I saw it or not. I may have forgot it. 1 John 5, 7, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. you believe that one? Amen. But again, if you're preaching out of an NIV, a New American Standard, a Holman, Holman Publishing is the publishing arm of the Southern Baptist Church, which is in a lot of trouble now, aren't they? Because they found out that a lot of their ministers are pedophiles and they've been covering it up like the Catholic Church has. Holman Christian Standard Bible and you name it, on and on and on, they have taken out 1 John 5, 7 and say it doesn't belong. I did this at a church in, um, not too far from here several years ago. I got asked to preach a revival at a church I'd never been to. And I mentioned some of this stuff and what I was preaching one night. And a guy came to me afterwards and he said, you are dead wrong on that King James stuff. And he said, I'm here to tell you right now, I'm not buying it. I said, oh, so you, do you believe that you can get rid of stubborn devils without prayer and fasting? He said the King James added that to the Bible should have never been in there. Huh? And at that point, I realized I was wasting my breath with this guy. Yeah. Now I said, I'm going to tomorrow night deal with this tomorrow night in the message. You come and I'm going to pray for you to see if maybe God will change you. But he had attitude the whole time yep, yep. that I preached it. I felt a spirit there, a hindrance. And I don't know where, he, where I don't know how it ended up with him. And I, I, and I promise you, I'm not somebody that is demanding out of you today that you make your decision right now. Because I've known pastors that have come to me and said, Brother Mike, I've heard you preach this, and boy, I was mad at you. I didn't, I didn't care much for you. But then God began to deal with me, and I started seeing what you were seeing, and I believe it now. Yeah. So I'm going to let the Holy Ghost do the job. Amen? It works better that way. But Now let me give you this. If you say that you use the NIV, which NIV are you using? Because the first edition came out, the New Testament came out in 1973, followed up by the Old Testament, and in 1984 they had their first revision. There have been five major revisions of the NIV 
since 1973. And in its current modified version, it has now become the gender neutral NIV. The New American Standard. The one the preachers all say, well, I study out of the New American Standard because it's the most literal to the Greek and Hebrew. And I've heard every preacher who uses the NASB say that to me. It's like a script that they have to re recite to give the reason why they use that translation. It's in its third revision. In fact, if you go to blueletterbible.org, you can pick between translations, and you'll see that you can search through the New American Standard Bible 1995 version. You can search the New American Standard Bible 2020 version. And now they're fixing to go through another revision of the New American Standard because John MacArthur has got a license from the Lockman Foundation. He is a five-point Calvinist, apparently. He's going to take that Bible, and number one, he's going to take all of the places where you see capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. He's going to take that out and replace it with Yahweh. But that's not his name. His name is the Lord. Amen. Did you know that even Jesus told us that? Amen. Now, I did learn a little Greek in college. I got a B plus in it. I got a D minus on the book of Revelation. I'm not kidding you. Nearly flunked the prophecy course. But anyway, every place in the New Testament where a New Testament quotes from an Old Testament verse that has the capital L-O-R-D in it, the Greek word there is kurios, which means Lord. Where Jesus quoted David as, David said, the Lord has said unto my Lord. And one of those Lords is capital L-O-R-D. And Jesus said kurios, meaning his name is the Lord. But MacArthur's going to take that out. MacArthur's going to take out every place he finds the word servant, Brother Reg. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, and replace it with the word slave. Because if you're a Calvinist, you didn't pick God. God picked you, and you're a slave, and you don't have a say in it. Proverbs 24, 21, My son, fear thou the Lord and the king, and meddle not with them that are given to change. So here's what I'm asking you. If you use an NIV and you memorized verses from it, they're no longer valid. You can't memorize verses out of a Bible that every 10 to 15 years is going to change right. the words in it. Right. 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 Same thing with the New American Standard. It'll be the same way with the Holman Christian Standard. That's how it goes. And it's because of these guys. This is Bruce Metzger. These are the names I learned in Bible college. Bruce Metzger, Alec Whitgren, Kurt Aland, and a man by the name of um, Carlos Martini. Yeah. Or excuse me, Father Carlos Martini, J.S. Society of Jesus. In fact, had Bergoglio not been picked as Pope, the front runner liberal was Carlos Martini. And since 1975, in the Greek New Testament. Uh, the International Bible Society, Novum Testamentum Gratium. Carlos Martini, the Jesuit, has been on that committee ever since 1975. He's now gone off and was replaced, there's Carlos Martini now, with Father Stephen Pisano, S.J., Society of Jesus, which means... There's another Jesuit yeah. on the committee that forms the Greek New Testament. Now this goes all the way back to like 1898 where a man by the name of um, Eberhard Nessel 
took the West Cotton Hort text and other Greek text, and he formed his own Greek text out of it. And then um, uh, a Kurt Aland, this guy right here, I don't, I don't think you can see it right here, right here in the, this guy here, he picked up the work in the 60s and 70s been on that committee for years. He, I think he's dead now and his wife took over his position. When I went to Bible college, 1984, I took Greek in 85, they made me go buy from the college bookstore a Greek New Testament and it was the International Bible Society Greek New Testament in the 27th edition. Now what does that tell you? 26 times before that, they had changed it. It is now in the 28th revision, and they are working now toward the 29th edition of changing and altering the Greek text. So it just stands to reason that if the Bible that you're using to read, to preach from, to teach from is based upon this Greek document that your Bible will be wrong in about 10 years from now because your Bible won't match the Greek text that's out now. And they'll have to retranslate your NIV or your New American Standard or your Holman Christian Standard or today's English version or whatever it is, they're going to have to retranslate those all over again, which is, that's a pretty good money maker. They sell you a Bible yeah. that's going to go bad in 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. That won't be any good in 10 years. Yeah. So you have to get rid of those and go out and buy, see it's marketing, it's money, isn't it? Yeah. Solo Scriptura, what does that mean? It is the source of what we believe and the limit of what we're allowed to believe. The rule is if God is silent, we should be too. Amen. That's a nice way of saying, if God didn't say it, shut up. Amen. So, Solo Scriptura is what our forefathers said, only the scriptures. It is what sets us apart from Catholics, Mormons, yep. Yep. That's right. those who have doctrines not supported or originated in the scripture. If God said it, the Bible says it. If the Bible speaks on a subject, we're to believe what it says. Amen. Any practice, doctrine, belief, way of salvation, attributes of God and Christ, etc., must be founded on at least two witnesses from the Bible, Amen. or you don't supposed to believe it. Amen. So if I were to ask you, could you show me in the Bible how Christ is God Almighty? Then very quickly we would go to verses like John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Isaiah 9, for unto us a child is born, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, Amen. the Everlasting Father, Amen. the Prince of Peace. Amen. John 8, 58, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Amen. And the Jews know what he was, knew what he was saying when he said that, didn't they? They rent their clothes. They, they, they made them nuts. Yeah. And they're crazy to this day over it. Amen. Amen. John 10, 30, I and my Father are one. John 17, 22, the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. 1 John 5, 7, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Amen. Now I'll put you to a challenge. I will put you to a challenge. So far, I've not come up with one. So if you can come up with one, I would gladly like to hear it. But if you take 1 John 5, 7 out of the Bible, can you show me another verse in the Bible that explicitly in no uncertain terms says that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are one and the same God? I can't think of one, Brother Reg. 
I mean, I can see it in typology. I can see it, you know, when Jesus comes out of the water, you know, this is my beloved son and the Holy Spirit lit up. But it, it's not telling you specifically that these three are one. It's not telling you that. You take 1 John 5, 7 out of the Bible, you have lost the main foundation of our Godhead doctrine. Amen. And if the foundations be destroyed, the whole house is going to fail. That's the plan. Is to destroy the foundation. Philippians 2 6, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. By the way, all of the new translations in English mess that verse up too. They do not have Christ as being equal with God in Philippians 2 6. You go to blueletterbible.org and you can check whether I'm lying to you or not. Now, it's possible. Let God be true and every man a liar. I'm capable of being wrong. I've been wrong several times in my life, okay, that I've admitted to. <laughs> if I were to ask you, can you show me the doctrine of the blood atonement? Would you go to a, would you go to a dictionary? Would you go to an encyclopedia? Where would you go? The Word of God, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, much more being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. But as you remember several years ago in the Free Will Baptist, there was a controversy over the blood issue. Do you remember that? There was a man that wrote, he was in one of the Free Will Baptist Bible Colleges, and he wrote a paper denying the blood was necessary for salvation. He said blood is a metonym, and it doesn't mean blood, it means death. And Jesus' blood was no different than any of his other bodily fluids. And so that guy was my first pastor. And I was going to have him preach a, a 30th anniversary homecoming at our church in 2004. And when I found that out, I said, no way is he preaching behind my pulpit. Amen. Amen. That man led my mom to the Lord. My mom is the one responsible for me. So if you're mad at me, get mad at my mom. Okay? She started me. But they trample on the blood. That's yeah. right. So to them, all of these verses mean nothing because they have tricks that they use with the Greek right. Amen. to make the Greek say something that's not really there. Yeah. Amen. Didn't, yeah. didn't it say in the book of Acts that God with his own blood hath purchased the church? Amen. Right. That's right. And this preacher in his paper said the original Greek carries with it the idea that it should have said, do you hear what I just said? Should have said the blood of his son. That doesn't say that. God's own blood. Salvation by grace through faith. Where do we go for that? Do we go to a commentary? Do we go to a, a cyclopedia? Do we go to Wikipedia? Do we go to Facebook to get our doctrine? No. Then stop getting your doctrine from Facebook. Amen. Except for if you're listening to Brother Reg or me. <laughs> Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith. I could stop there. Yeah. For God's loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Amen. See, it's pretty simple. When you just read the scriptures, right? Amen. The creation of the universe in six days. Do we need to get out geologist tools? Do we need to measure these layers and test how old these layers? Well, this layer here is 3.4 billion years old. You were there? 
No, we just believe Exodus 20, for in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth. Yes. Exodus 31, it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested. Amen. Genesis 131, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good, and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Amen. Genesis 2, thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them, and on the seventh day God ended his work, which he had made. Six days, by the way, six literal 24-hour days, because it says here in verse 31, and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. That's not 50 billion years of time. You know all these space telescopes we keep sending up? You know what they're looking for? They're looking for the original, you know, the Big Bang thing. Do you know what they're not seeing? They're not seeing evidence of light that formed 13 billion years ago because that's how say that's how old they say the universe is. They're not seeing the light evidence of the universe being formed. They're seeing from light that they say is 13 billion light years away, fully formed galaxies, stars. Right. It's like they just appeared in one day. Yeah. Right. And they did. Amen. So now, let me ask you this. What you believe about the Bible, your doctrine of the Bible, where should you get your doctrine of the Bible. Should you get it from the Bible college, like what happened with me? Should you get it from the pastor who tells you that there's really no major differences in any of the translations and they don't affect any major doctrine? No? Should you get them from Facebook? No the internet, YouTube videos. My point is this. When God changed me, we were still in that old denomination and I was pleading with some guys, some guys I went to Bible college with, some guys I'd known for years about this issue of the King James. One guy in particular, we used to be friends in Bible college. And he kept, he was listening to me, he kept saying, Mike, now Mike, be careful, you don't go too far with this. I said, where is that? Because apparently he thought I was already there. And I said, let me, let me just put it down to you straight, Melvin. If you can show me in my Bible what verse tells me that everything I just said to you was wrong, I'll believe it. Now, I need two. But I would accept, in this one case, I would accept just one verse that tells me that my Bible, now, I can expect it to be wrongly translated and not totally preserved. If you can show me that, then I'll believe it. But if you can't show that to me, you have to ask yourself, where did you get your beliefs about the Bible? Right. 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 <coughs> so can I believe that my Bible is 100% correct in every subject and in every word? Is it biblical or is it just the emotional? This is what they say about us. It's just an emotional connection to a book that has errors. And see, really, I mean, I, I, it's the King James. But if, if it was, let's say, the NIV, just by perchance, but that I believe that the New International Version was 100% right in everything that it said, then that would be the Bible I would be reading from and memorizing and preaching from and using because my Bible told me that my Bible would never, ever be wrong. Amen. Never. Right. But it also told me, just like 
we read a while ago, if we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. Now that verse is there in the other translations, but do you know what it says? We are not as others who peddle the word of God for profit. Yeah. <laughs> well, then what? Let me tell you why the Holman Christian Standard Bible came about. Let me tell you how it came about. For years, Holman Publishing, which is the publishing arm of the Southern Baptist Convention, they were getting a license every year from Zondervan to use NIV verses in all of their Sunday school literature, their teaching literature, vacation Bible school literature, everything. Meaning that they were paying Zondervan every year for the right to reproduce those verses. Follow me so far? So they got together and they said, what, we don't have Greek scholars in the denomination? We don't have Bible colleges? Why are we paying Zondervan? Why don't we just come up with our own Bible and then we could print it all we want to and we don't have to pay royalties to anybody? Yeah. Yeah. So they did. They came up with a brand new translation of the Bible that legally is significantly different from every other translation of the Bible That's right. or they would have been guilty of copyright yeah. errors, copyright breaking copyright laws, and they would be in a lawsuit. Yeah. Yeah. So they made a Bible that was significantly different than every other translation so that they wouldn't have to pay royalties anymore to print it. Yeah, that's right. So what do the scholars and believers acknowledge? Here's, here's what I've read, what I've heard from ministries all over the country. We believe in the total inerrancy and infallibility of the Word of God. The Word of God is correct in every word, in everything that it says. In the original manuscripts. Now, I believe that. And I'll show you why I believe that. Paul said, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. So when Paul wrote that, was there an error in what he wrote? No. No. Uh, Paul had usually someone writing for him because we know that Paul in Galatians he takes the pen and says see with what large letter I write unto you with mine own hand we know that Paul had an eye problem couldn't see very well but he sort of signed the book of Galatians by taking the pen and writing out these words like in big you know how big crayon letters like this like you know four year olds do okay but we know that Paul didn't make any mistakes when he when he transmitted or uh, spoke those words to whoever was writing them down, there was no mistakes in that. So in that original manuscript, every word was 100% right. right. And I believe that. Second yeah. Peter 1.21, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Let me tell you what I'm hearing now. We're hearing now preachers say, well, I, I think Paul must have really been having a bad day that day because he really come unglued on those people. Excuse me, those weren't Paul's words. Right. Amen. Amen. Right. Right. Yeah. None of them were. Amen. Right. Amen. They were the words that God gave him to put down in that letter. Amen. Amen. Jeremiah, here's the method of transmission. But the Lord, Jeremiah 1, the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Where did the words come from? God, be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. Amen. And you see, a lot of these scholars that translate the Bibles now, they don't believe that even the original words right. were inspired. That's right. 
One of the guys on the NIV, I had this in a video I used, got it from Gail Ripplinger, got it from her book. But I, she quoted one of the NIV translators and said that the Bible is not what you think it is. It, it's like looking at the back side of an embroidery. You know what I'm talking about, ladies? The front side is where the picture is. The back side is where all the knots are. Yeah. Yeah. And it doesn't look like the front side. And this guy, this idiot yeah. on the NIV translating committee sitting next to that butch lesbian yep. yeah. said that the Bible is the wrong side of a beautiful embroidery. That it's close to what God probably said, but it's not exactly what God said. So how can a guy like that handle the Word of God? Because all he's going to do is handle the Word of God deceitfully. Um, I've put my words in thy mouth. Same thing with Ezekiel. I mean, and think, and think, about, think about these stories in the Bible. When Moses received the commandments from God, were they in oral form or written form? Written. God wrote them with his own finger in that tablet of stone. Amen. Those were the Moses came down from Mount Sinai literally with the words of God written by the hand of God. Amen. Amen. Ezekiel the same way. Ezekiel, after he sees the, the chariot of God in Ezekiel 1, you know the UFO God was riding in? That's a joke. Because if you know, some of you who know me know I'm studying it. Um, and, and I'm excited. L let me unhook the train for a second. Last year, I felt like God was telling me to go to the Mutual UFO Network Symposium in Las Vegas, Nevada. Lost wages. And so we made up a bunch of DVDs that deal on the UFO issue and what they are. They're devils. Amen. Okay? And um, so anyway, we made a bunch of those up, and we took them down there. And there was a lady that follows our ministry. She is... Uh, She's Mexican, moved up here, and buddy, she's like one of those Mexican merchants. You ever been to Mexico and had to haggle with those guys? They don't let you go, do they? No. No, and buddy, she didn't let anybody walk out of that room without a bundle of DVDs in her hand. So I'm, so I'm flying her into Denver this year. But anyway, she's just throwing DVDs out as fast as she can. And there was a German reporter there, and he sees... I, we made a banner up that says ufopastor.com. Now, at a UFO conference, you've got every weird freakoid in the country. Okay? And they're all from California. Okay? And they're, they're seeing your auras, and they're playing with your chakras, and they're doing all kinds of... But this guy thought I was the weird guy at a UFO conference. <laughs> So he wants to interview me and say, what is, a, what is a Protestant minister doing at a UFO conference? So I, and it was a great interview. I just sat down with him and gave him you know, the word of God. I said, here's what I believe they are. And I gave him scriptures and so on. And I thought, there ain't no telling what he's going to write. Well, he sent me the article. It was a wonderful article that he wrote about me. Very favorable. So they, it got, he published it on his, on his website, and then it, I think it got published in a magazine, and then uh, somebody did a radio program on it, and a film production company heard about it. They started watching my videos on UFOs. They contacted me. They're going to come to our church July 5th and 6th and film us doing a church service and a teaching on UFOs and what they are and they're going to put me in their documentary series. So the weirdest people in the world are going to get to hear the other side of the issue. Okay? That's why the devil's been beating our family up. 
But anyway, let me move on. Ezekiel 2, God handed Ezekiel a roll. And he said, eat, these, eat this roll. Speak my words unto them. The roll of a book. And after, he said in verse uh, 1 of Ezekiel 3, Son of man, eat that thou findest. Eat this roll and go speak unto the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he calls me to eat the roll. And he said unto me, Son of man, go get thee unto the house of Israel and speak with my words unto them. So the words of God were written on the roll. Ezekiel put them in him. They, listen, preachers, they got to be in you first. Amen. That's right. Then you give them to your people. Amen. And that's what Ezekiel did. He gave them the words of God. No commentary. Nothing else. He gave them the word of God. Uh, and these inspired words are written. Amen. Yeah. Don't listen to anybody who says they're getting revelations and visions yeah. from God about things that are happening. Right. Yeah. No. If it's not in the Bible, you don't believe it. Amen. He told Moses, write this for a memorial in a book. Exodus 34, write thou these words. Moreover, the Lord said unto me, Take a great roll and write in it with a man's pen concerning Mary Shalal Hashbaz. I wanted to name one of my grandkids that. No, none of my kids will let me. <laughs> Isaiah 30, now go write it before them in a table and note it in a book that it may be for what? The time to come forever. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Who in here has ever signed a contract, a rental agreement, a, a mortgage, or anything like that? Yeah. According to the law, you and whoever you sign that contract with are bound by the words on that four corners of that paper. Yeah. And let's say that you signed a rental agreement with somebody and you moved in their house or their house trailer or whatever, and it said in the lease agreement, no pets of any kind, no dogs, nothing. And you live there about six months and you go to the landlord and say, can we please have a little puppy? My kid wants a puppy. Landlord says, well, maybe I guess. <coughs> Did you know he could come back and sue you and win? Yeah. Yeah. Listen to this. Yeah. Because a verbal oral agreement cannot ever nullify a previously written agreement. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> and almost without fail, on every legal contract, there's words that say, this is now the totality of the agreement between the first party and the second party, and without their prior written signed permission, no other parts of, a, of an, another contract can be added to this. What is at the very end of your Bible? Jesus saying to us, if any man take away from the words of the prophecy of this book, I will take his name out of the book of life. If any man shall add unto the words of the prophecy of this book, I will add unto him the plagues that are written therein. You agreed when you got saved, you agreed to a contract between you and God, where God said, if you will trust me, I will forgive your sins. Somebody say amen. So you know what the devil's doing? He's trying to change the terms of the contract. That's why it must be written. Write all these words that I've spoken to thee in a book. Take the roll of a book and write therein all the words. You remember Jeremiah having these words written out and they were delivered to that king, Jehoiakim. What'd he do? Cut it up with his pen knife, toss it into the fire, and he said, there's your, there's, that's what I think of that. Now it won't happen. Jeremiah said, sit down. <laughs> Not only is God going to have me give you the words again of what was in that copy, but now we're going to add a whole bunch more to it. And he's not going to like it. Habakkuk, write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. And people nowadays don't make handshake agreements with people. If it involves anything more than a hundred bucks, put it on paper. Because courts if, if, it's a, if it's on paper, you're, you win. 
If anybody goes against, if it's written down, anybody goes against it, you win because it was written, signed, noted, sealed, and you're going to win the lawsuit, whatever it is. Make sure it's written down. Amen. God's smart. And he knows men lie, doesn't he? Amen. Let me move past this. Now, up here, it says original manuscripts, and I've got these tattered texts. Are those the original manuscripts? No. How do you know? There are none. Now ask, just think about it. Why didn't God let survive the original manuscripts? Because that was my argument with a guy. When I was in those wilderness days, I had a guy tell me, Mike, King James. I said, listen, if you can show me the original manuscripts and I can be able to then compare the original New Testament with the Greek New Testament that I got in Bible college or then the Textus Receptus, if I could compare the two, then I would know instantly which one's right, which one's wrong. But since there are no originals, then there is no way of knowing whether or not which either one of them's right. I have no way of knowing. That was my, that was the lunacy that I was in back in those days. And that's the argument I gave him. He said, give me the original manuscripts and I'll believe it. But God said, I have a better idea. It's called, do you trust me? Amen. And see, that's what it boiled down to with me. I didn't. I was in the ministry and didn't trust him. He's been working on that. Trust me. Now, those originals, they were written on two different types of medium. One is called papyrus. It's where we get the word paper from. And it's basically this big reed, this marsh reed, and it's a grass. And they would take that, that reed grass, and they'd cut it, they'd split it, and then take the layers you know how grass is, if you let it grow, it you know, has these layers in it. And they would weave those together, and then they would press them and leave them lay out in the sun to dry, and then you had this flat, smooth document that you could write ink on. That's where we get the word paper, papyrus. And papyrus is basically grass. Then you have this other medium that they wrote on called vellum. Vellum was an animal skin, either from a goat or a lamb or something like that with soft, like soft underbelly skin especially, they would take that, that flesh, that skin, they would, you know how you cure uh, hides and things like that, salt them down, hang them, whatever, scrape them and do all that stuff, and they would do that and they had some, you know, some things then to write it down on. Now there's a reason why I'm saying all this to you. Because God accounted for the fact that the originals were going to vanish away. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because he said, Isaiah 40, the voice said, cry. And he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass. Now, remember, papyrus is grass. Vellum is flesh. And God has just told you now, they're the same because they both pass away, don't they? And all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. So the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand Amen. forever. Amen. Amen. So God said, even if it's written on grass or flesh, even if that completely disappears, Amen. don't worry. Yeah. I will not let one single word of my word vanish away. Amen. It will, I will make sure 
that my word is in this world forever. Amen. And you'll never have to worry about whether or not you've got the inerrant word of God in your hand. You'll never have to worry about that. Peter quoted this and said, 1 Peter 1, 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed. So now, and let me, let me address this. The NIV is corruptible seed. Because yes. yep. number one, it comes from corrupt Greek documents. Yep. Yep. And number two, since they keep changing the Greek text every 15, 20 years, and they keep changing the NIV every 20 years, that means that the early NIV is already old and passed away and corrupted, and now you've got to get another one. Th those words are gone. Okay? Gone into history. Gone, gone, gone. So that's corruptible seed, and can you be born again with corruptible seed? Now, here's what I'm going to tell you, though. Judge no man before the time. Had your pastor judged me in 1995, he would be up here preaching against Mike Hoggard and saying, stay away from that idiot. He uses the NIV. <clears throat> Wouldn't you? But God changed me. Amen. And I've had pastors come to me. And they said, Mike, first time I heard you talk about that, I, I just knew you were wrong. I just knew you were wrong. And then God showed me something one day, and it hit me. Maybe my Bible is right 100% of everything that it says. So I, I'm not here to be anybody's enemy. I want you to like me. That has always been my problem. Is that I wanted to get along with everybody, and so I would compromise but I can't compromise anymore. I still want you to like me. But some people, yes, are going to die in their sins because of corruptible seed. But because you don't know men of God, women of God, families, and how God is going to work in them one day to change them. Yeah then don't judge them yet. Maybe they haven't learned everything that you've learned. Maybe they haven't. Maybe they were like me. Maybe they went to Bible college. And that's just what they were told, and that's what they, and God hasn't really worked in them yet. So you pray for them. And pray that God changes their heart. Amen. So being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. By the word of God, which liveth and abideth for how long? Forever. Forever. And that word in incorruptible, it means not only is it not corrupt, it can't be corrupted. Amen. Can a bullet go through Superman's suit? No. Neither can the real word of God be corrupted. Amen. For all flesh is grass, and the glory of man is flower of grass. He's quoting Isaiah. The grass withereth, the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. It is a gospel salvation issue, is it not? Amen. It is the gospel issue, salva a salvation issue. Because at some point, either God has to get involved in their life, and they come by one of our, Brother Reg's talks, or one of mine, or maybe some of yours, if you put King James Bible verses on your Facebook page, which is what you ought to, Amen. instead of gossip, Amen. maybe that will reach somebody, and it will hit them one day. And God will do with them what he did for you. Don't ever forget 
that there's still people out there that God can change. Amen. Dallas Theological Seminary, here's what they said. We believe that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Sounds good. By which we understand that the whole Bible is inspired in the sense that holy men of God were moved by the Holy Spirit to write the very words of Scripture. We believe that this divine inspiration extends equally and fully to all parts of the writings, historical, poetical, doctrinal, and prophetical, as appeared in the original manuscripts. So they believe in a Bible that doesn't exist. We believe that the whole Bible in the originals is therefore without error. And they will always stop right there. But I'm here to help. I'm here to help. I'm here to show you. Bob Jones University, same thing. They say we have never taken the position that there can be only one good translation in the English language. But see, I've seen their videos. I've seen them I've seen them in their video say, now, guys, when you get behind the pulpit, you tell the people in your church, you absolutely believe in the Word of God. But the truth is, we know there's errors in the translation. In other words, lie. Campus Cape, Crusade for Christ, various churches, ministries all over the world, Basically the same thing. They stop with the inerrancy of scriptures at the original manuscripts which do not exist. Calvary Chapel, same thing. Now, we get into the doctrine of preservation. Where should our doctrine of the preservation come from? Should it come from the history books? Should it come from James White? You know who that is? Yeah. Little sissy bow tie wearing guy. <laughs> he writes a book called The King James Only Country, and he hates the King James Bible. He hates it. You can hear it in him. And his arrogance and pompous attitude toward anybody who believes in the King James comes out very easily from him. So should I get my doctrine from James White? Nope. I should only get my doctrine on the preservation of the Bible from the Bible. Amen. So, again, being born again, not a corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is grass. We already read that verse. The word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. So God said that he would preserve every word. Amen. So if God said that, and the International Bible Society, moving from its 28th to its 29th revision of the Greek text, takes words out of the 28th edition and puts different words in the 29th edition, it means that they don't believe that the Word of God should remain unchanged. Whereas the, we see the Word of God as a rock, an immovable rock, yeah. they see it as a great big jar of Play-Doh. Yeah. We mold it and make it after how we want. Yeah. Yeah. Deuteronomy 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do how many words of the law? All, All of them. The words of the Lord are pure words. Amen. You know what R is? Yeah. It's what pirates say. R. <laughs> I got a better laugh in Wichita, Kansas over that one. <laughs> it's present tense. Are the words of God still pure words? Yes. Sure they are. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt 1604 to 1611. Do the math. Seven years. That's how long it took those men to get all the dross out of the bishop's Bible 
get all the dross out of the Geneva Bible Amen. and come up with a pure Amen. word of God. Amen. Words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. And all the English translations of the Bible, except the King James, destroys verse 7 by saying, Lord, you will keep and preserve us forever. Yeah. That's not what it says. Amen. Isaiah 30. Now go, write it before them in the table and note it in a book that it may be for the time to come forever. God said the words that Isaiah wrote, he would preserve every one of them forever. Amen. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. The counsel of the Lord standeth how long? Forever. The thoughts of his heart to how many generations? Oh. That means every generation has had the word of God that God wanted them to have. Amen. Every generation. That's right. Thy testimonies are very sure. Holiness becometh thy house, O Lord, forever. For his merciful kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord. Amen. Now, if God said that, and then you come to me and try to tell me that my Bible has a mistake in it. You're the liar. Amen. You're the liar. Right. Not me. Yeah. And not God. That's right. Amen. All Scripture is, is yeah. which is present tense, yeah. is given by inspiration of God. Are you saying God still gives new words out there? No. But I'll tell you, when you open that book and read it, God will inspire you while you're reading it. Amen. The Holy Ghost will say, now look at that verse. Yeah. Now remember what you read a year ago, and he'll bring it back to your mind, and you'll go, Woo! Amen. Right. Yeah. That is so cool! <laughs> Amen. 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 It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction of righteousness, that the man of God may be... Perfect. So how can an imperfect book make me perfect? Yeah. Can't. That's right. Thoroughly furnished and do all good works. And in that phrase there is our doctrine of sola scriptura that says, if it's not the Bible, don't believe it. Yeah. Right. Now, some of you, some of y'all are not into this, and I'm not saying you have to be. But I've studied UFOs all my life, had just had an interest in them. And if I was not able to discover from the Bible exactly what that was, I wouldn't be talking about it. Because yeah. Yeah. I'd be saying, they don't exist. Yeah. Yeah. Because I believe Jesus Christ made everything that is. Yeah. And if he didn't make that and he didn't show it to me in his word, then I don't believe it. Amen. We're not going to have an argument. You're not going to ever have an argument with me about Santa Claus, are you? Because I don't see nowhere in here where Santa Claus comes down the chimney and he puts presents under the. I don't see that in here. Amen. So it doesn't exist. Okay? So, but if God says it and he teaches it to you from his word, then you believe it. You believe it, okay? Second Peter 1, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. This was written right after Peter said, I was there when God himself said, this is my beloved son. I heard those words. Amen. Amen. But Peter's like saying, you don't have to trust me. Yep. We're going to have us a Bible put together soon. And every one of those books is going to be a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well that you take heed as into a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Amen. Now let me, let me tell you what I think that means. One of the arguments that some of your fellow pastors will try to use against you 
is that they will say, well, I listen, I read that the King James translators didn't just stick to the Greek and Hebrew when it came to translating. They used other translations along with that. That's not right, is it? And you say, yes, it is. Because it plainly says on these old King James Bibles, translated out of the original tongues with the former translations, um, Diligently compared and revised. Yeah. Which means that in the process of looking at the Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic, they also went back to Luther's Bible, the old Italic Bible, all the previous vernacular translations that they had access to. Because you know why? Because if God said it one language, he had to have said it in every language. Because in Revelation Seven, what do we have? People of every nation, kindred, and... God just don't speak Greek. He just don't speak Hebrew. And for sure, God just doesn't speak hillbilly. Amen! He speaks all the languages because he invented them. Amen! So, you tell them uh, excuse me, it says right here that no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation. The word interpretation in the King James means translation. Eloi, yeah. Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is interpreted. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The translators knew that they couldn't just come up with a completely different interpretation or translation of the Bible that they had to make sure that they were following the history of what God had said throughout the ages. They were sticking with what the brethren had always known and believed throughout the centuries. And no matter what language it was translated in, they were going to make sure that the Bible that we had said the same thing that God said to the Germans, to the Italians, to the Greeks and whoever. They were going to make sure of that. Does that make sense to you? Amen. So when they come up with a new Bible, new Bible translation, they will advertise it and say, this is a fresh interpretation of God's Word. No other Bible is like this. That tells you right there. Right. Yep. You shouldn't read it. Amen. Okay? For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. When people say, well, the Bible was written by men. Yeah, but it was just written by men. But the words were spoken by God and show them the verse. Deuteronomy 18, 15, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee of thy brethren like unto me, and unto him shall ye hearken. He's talking about Christ. According to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again thy voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more that I die not. And the Lord said unto me, They have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth. Amen. He shall speak unto them all that I shall command him, and it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. Amen. Now, I believe this, that if you die in a sinful state of repeatedly saying, there are things in the Bible I just don't believe. I fear for you. Because he just said, it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words which he shall speak in my name. God says there's going to be a reckoning for that. And I'm not going to be found guilty of saying that any word in my English 1611 Bible is wrong. 
I won't do it. I may not understand everything in the Bible, but I believe everything in the Bible. Uh, okay, Deuteronomy 8. T turn your Bibles here. I haven't had you turn your Bibles much. Turn your Bibles here. What time is it? Lunchtime, what, did you say dinner was two? Deuteronomy 18, verse 20. Not only has it not been corrupted, it, it, it cannot be corrupted. And if it is corrupted in one place, then we don't have to believe any of the rest of it. That's right. right. Amen. And that comes from here. They asked Moses, so Moses, how do we... How are we going to know? I mean, prophets arise and they tell us things, they show us signs and wonders, and they come to pass. Yeah. And, and that just seems like God must have done that. Well, Moses said, well, here, I'll ask God and then I'll tell you what he said. And so here's what he said. The prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, and listen, yeah. those gods are coming. Yeah. 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 They are coming. They're going to fall out of the sky, and they're coming. You know, when Catholics pray to the saints, they're praying to other gods yep. before God. That's, right. yeah. That's why God said, you shall have no other gods before me. Amen. Mary's not a mediator. St. Paul, St. Jerome, St. Ignoramus de Loyola is not a, not a mediator. But Jesus is because he's God. How shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? Verse 22, when a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. Yeah. But the prophet that hath spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. So whereas man always likes to set a low standard of accepting things, like voting for Joe Biden. <laughs> That's a low standard. Right. Which, to be honest with you, you don't find very many people that actually say uh, they voted on him. Right. That's going to get me kicked off YouTube for sure. I got censored. I, I did. I got censored by YouTube. I said one thing about the election in 2020, and they took that video. It was a sermon. They took it down and put a strike against my channel, and I couldn't upload for a week. And they said, three strikes, and we take your channel down for good. Now, I'm in their pro I'm in I'm on probation. I got ACO monitor here by yeah, <laughs> YouTube and But they just told me that they're gonna listen to everything I say from here on out. I, until June, whenever, then I'm out of prison. <laughs> But God said, my standard is high. If he's wrong one time, you don't believe him. And I mean, don't believe him on anything. It doesn't matter if he's right 20 times. If he's wrong the 21st time, you don't believe him. That's how high God's standard, I mean, what's God's standard of righteousness? Perfection. What's God's standard of purity? 100% purity. We like to reduce the standards to make them conform to us so that we are good people, but we're not. Amen. Only God is. Uh, do, let's see here. We already did that. Now, preservation of every word. I'm going to run through these fast. So shall I keep thy law continually forever and ever. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Concerning thy testimonies, I have known of old that thou hast founded them forever. How long? The word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. 
Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, which made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that therein is, which keepeth truth forever. Amen. So if you want me to believe that over time errors crept into the manuscripts, you are a liar. Amen. Like I used to be. On that issue, you're a liar. And again, I challenge you. I am challenging you right now to come up with a verse that says my Bible would ever be wrong. One time. Show me a verse. Amen. I need two. I'll take one. And see... I would put every dime I own on this bet because I know I'm going to win it. Amen. What I'm telling you is there is no verse anywhere in the Bible that says God's Word would diminish. Right, right. That God's Word would corrupt away and fade away. He said the exact opposite of that. The lip of truth shall be established forever, but the lying tongue is but for a moment. Now think about that. That's why... The NIV has been changed five times. It's a lying tongue. I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it that men should fear before Him. So did God write your Bible? Did God write your Bible? Yes. Amen. Did God preserve your Bible? Yes. <laughs> now go write it before them in a table, note it in a book, that it may be for the time to come forever and ever. The grass withereth, the foul flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Amen. Now, uh, Jesus answered and saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And if the Greek New Testament committee says to us that we don't have every word of God, they're lying because God said we did. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. First Peter 1 Peter 1.25, but the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Second John 1 John 1.2, for the truth's sake, which dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever. When Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, this is why old saints, when they die, they say, put my Bible in my casket because I'm going to take it with me to glory. The Word of God's never going to leave me. Amen. Amen. Preserved Word preserves those who trust in it. Believe that? Yeah. Withhold not thou thy tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let thy loving kindness and thy truth continually preserve me. So how can an unpreserved word preserve a saint? He shall abide before God forever. O prepare mercy and truth which may preserve him. Mercy and truth preserve the king. His throne is upholden by mercy. He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the way of his saints. The eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge and he overthroweth the words of the transgressor. Preservation of every word again. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, his truth endureth to all generations. And confirm the same unto Jacob for a law, unto Israel for an everlasting covenant. The righteousness of thy testimonies is everlasting. Give me understanding and I shall live. And that's my prayer always. God, give, show me more. Amen. Don't stop teaching me, God. I'm not done learning. I still want to know things from the book. The righteousness of thy testimonies is everlasting. Give me under Again, our righteousness comes from Christ, who is the Word of God. Amen. If that Word of God is corrupt, how then can we have any righteousness? Yeah. And see if there, Psalm 139, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way 
everlasting. For I, the Lord, love judgment and hate robbery for burnt offering, and I will direct their work in truth, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Robbery for burnt offering. I'm, I'm reminded of this. I'm going to tell you something that I'm probably not supposed to tell you. I want you to pray for our ministries, uh, especially the work in Kenya. Uh, as you may know, God has given us two full-time FM radio stations in Kenya. One in Samburu County, which is north central Kenya. The other one in Turkana County, which is northwest Kenya. And in both locations, both the Seventh-day Adventists, who have a very large presence in Kenya, and the Catholic Church have come marching into our radio station offices and saying, uh, you need to take that Mzungu off your radio station. He's preaching things about us, he's telling lies, and he's saying things about us and we don't like it. To get him off the radio station. And they said, well, we, we can't, he writes our checks. So, <laughs> So that didn't work. So then the Catholic Church tried to buy us out in Samburu. They offered us two million dollars to sell out the people of Samburu to the Pope. And when Michael, my son-in-law, was telling me about it, he said the Catholic Church trying to buy us out. I said, you told him no, right? He said, yeah. And I said, just out of curiosity, how much did they offer? He said, two million dollars. I went, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, my first thought was, you know, Mike, you could take that and do, do great things. No, I would be selling those Amen. people Amen. out. Amen. A high-ranking Kenya government official is known for taking government money that's supposed to go to build an orphanage or a repair roads or anything. Let's say he'll take $10 million. He's got a Catholic church that he funnels and launders that money through. And he gives the priest two million, he keeps eight million. And I'm not lying to you. That's a fact. And I can't tell you much more than that. Because God has us involved in a work over there that I cannot wrap my head around it. But just pray. Just pray for pray for us. Um, let me move on. Now, let's see here. Let's get into, so I asked you the question, who wrote your Bible? You said God. I asked you the question, who preserved your Bible? And you said so now, and by the way, does it, before I go on, does anybody have any questions? Any, any doubt in your mind? I'm here to help. I won't, yeah, yes, sir. Uh, if someone's like reading out of a different Bible, get out of reading from the Bible, God still speak to them? Here's what I'm going to tell you. There's a question mark. If the question was, if somebody's reading out of another translation, can God speak to them through that? Here's what I want to tell you, okay? You can only be born again from incorruptible seed. Right. Okay, now, again, this is why I said, don't judge people right now. Maybe you got family members that are going to another church and they're using the NIV or yeah. some of these other Bibles. Yeah. Pray for them. Yeah. Okay, and, and live that Bible in front of them. Yeah. Amen. Because if they watch you mess your life up and all along you were telling them you got the wrong Bible, yeah. you just made God a joke to them. And you made that Bible a joke to them. Yeah, right. 
But what I'll say to you is this, okay? God changed me. And it was only God that changed me. So I was off reading from other Bibles during a time in my ministry. Now, I only preached out of a King James, but I was trying to look at other translations, looking for maybe better thing. Maybe the NIV said it better than the King James and it would give me better understanding. I mean, that's just what I was taught or I was looking at the Greek or the Hebrew and so on. And my wife, we'd be riding home from church and she'd say, would you stop giving them Greek lessons every Sunday? Well, I got mad at her. I'm like, I spent money learning that. And you know what, you know what I was doing? I was trying to elevate myself above those people that I was right. told to go and love by making them think that I was smarter than they were and, they, and that they would not get anything from God unless they got it from me through a Greek lesson. Wow. Amen. That was just pure arrogance all the way. Some people have not heard and they've not been told that there's a difference. Some people have been told wrongly by a pastor that all the Bible translations are the same. In fact, they like to get all the translations out and look at all the translations and see. And all that's going to do is bring confusion because they don't say the same thing. They contradict one another. So my statement is, at some point, God is either going to turn them over to a reprobate mind or God is going to bring them out to the truth. Okay, that's what I'm going to say to you. I have testimony from people who say that they have followed this ministry. They were doing the Hebrew roots thing. They did the uh, they did the Seventh Day Adventist thing. They did all these. They were in the charismatic movement and doing all that thing, and they were starving to death. They were reading all these other Bibles and so on and so on and so on, and then they some video I put out that got their interest and they started watching it and they saw that the verses that I was given was different than what they had ever read before or heard from before. And they knew then that was the Spirit of God in that, that God was speaking to them. And these people said, I think we got the wrong Bible. So that's what I'm here for. I'm here to help you do the same thing that God helped me do. Amen. Come back to that old book and trust in it. Yeah. Trust in every word. Don't change one word in that book. Amen. Young man, I appreciate that. That's a good question. Okay? Amen. So don't judge them yet. Don't say, well, you're lost because you're reading out of NIV. Don't do that. You're not God. Amen. Right. Right. Who art thou that judges another man's servant? They don't work for you. You're not their daddy. You're not anything to them but a friend or somebody they know. Let God have them. Because it wasn't a man that changed me. It was God. Amen. Okay? Anybody else got a question? I'll get into the translation. Yes, sir. You yeah, talking about the revisions of these others. One of the big things I get is, well, the King James was revised in about 18... What's your answer to that? Answer? I love that one. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. What's the question? Okay. <laughs> well, you Italians just can't keep your mouth shut, can you? <laughs> anyway, um, the question was what? Oh, the, has the King James been revised over the years? When I was in the wilderness, I went to a denominational meeting in North Carolina and the esteemed Greek professor from the Bible College was going to speak on the King James issue, Brother Edge. And I went to that. I'm going, I'm going to hear this and I'm going to root for him because I know the man. And he said this. He said, to those of you who believe and read the King James, let me ask you which King James do you believe? Do you believe the 1611 King James? Or do you believe the 1651 King James? Or do you believe the 1729 revision of the King James? Because it's been revised several times and they're not the same Bible as the one you have. And I went, yeah, you guys, listen to him. 
And I thought that man was telling the truth. He was lying. He was lying through his teeth. Amen. Because a couple years later, my wife bought me for my birthday a reprint of the 1611 King James Bible. A man that follows our ministry sent me, and you can find these online, a page from the 1611 King James Bible. The actual page out of a King James Bible in a real nice uh, frame and sent it to me. I opened that up. I bawled like a baby over that. Yeah. And I got it hanging in my office. So I started reading that, that reprint of the 1611. And I went, it's the same. Yeah. Amen. Now, I have notes on this somewhere. There's a book on Google Books. Um, Gail Ripplinger wrote about this in one of her later books, and I, I checked her out on it, and she was right. In 1850, the American Bible Society took up the question, has the Bible been changed or altered since its original translation in 1611. Now we're talking about 1850, okay? No other, no other real Bibles out there that have gained any, you know, trust. So everybody had a King James. So the committee in 1850 went and examined the issue. And they released a report, and I have the document. You can get it off the internet. They said that as far as orthography, which is the spelling of the words, and certain typographical errors that would naturally come about as a result of printing so many pages with so many words on them, there have been corrections of typographical errors and corrections in the spelling of the words. But as pertaining to the words themselves, the Bible from 1611 comes to us unchanged Amen. since 1611. Amen. And all you need to do, you go online right now and go to Amazon and find a reprint of a 1611 King James Bible and start reading it. And I promise you, every now and then, you'll see one of those typographical errors. There was one Bible called the Adulterer's Bible. Yeah. Because it said, thou shalt commit adultery. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, they left not out. Yeah. Okay? It was a mistake. But it, we're not talking about where they took whole verses out, yeah. where they took the name of Jesus out, yeah. where they didn't call him. We're not talking about that. We're talking about fixing typos. Yeah. Yeah. That's the only change that's ever been made. And when I found that out, I was angry. Yeah. First at that doctor so-and-so yeah. who, and I don't know why he lied like that. He must have heard it from somebody and just ran with it. But I guarantee you he didn't study it out himself. He'd have been an idiot if he would have. But when I found that out, I was angry. That man lied to me, and I trusted him at one time. So you can be assured that for over 400 years, this Bible has not been altered. Not one time. Amen. All right. Is my Bible translated? Okay. Um... Are those notes in here. Turn to Isaiah 28. Isaiah 28 is a very, very potent chapter of the Bible. Isaiah 28 mentions wine and strong drink. If you want to make a note for this, study it out on your own. Wine and strong drink. Especially strong drink that when it's mentioned it's when strong drink is mentioned It's usually always mentioned with wine, too So it tells you that the wine they're drinking is full of alcohol The word wine itself in the Bible does not automatically assume that it's alcoholic wine That's right. The word wine simply means vino yeah. from the vine yeah. Okay 
and you don't automatically see that if it's wine, it must have alcohol in it. Right. They just simp they didn't say the word grape juice. They said fruit. What, new wine comes from the cluster, the Bible says. When the butler was restored to Pharaoh's right hand to hold his cup, Joseph said that he would be squeezing the wine into Pharaoh's cup. Yeah. Un and you know what causes fermentation of wine, don't you? Leaven. Yeah, that's right. Leaven, which is a type of sin and false doctrine. Yeah. 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 The leaven has eaten and taken the sweetness out of the wine and replaced it with an intoxicant, yeah. alcohol. Yeah, that's good. Okay? So, uh, Jesus drank wine. <laughs> so Isaiah 28, uh, notice, woe to the crown of pride to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower. Look at verse 7. So wine and strong drink they signify false doctrine and false teaching. Benny Hinn, yeah. Rodney Howard Brown, guess let's get drunk in the spirit, shall we? Okay, those people, they are so evil. Amen. They have a drunken spirit on them. Yes. Yeah. And you know what spirit that is? Who holds the cup of strong drink? Babylon does. Yeah. They have erred through wine through strong drink are out of, what's those two words? Who is the way? Through strong drink, they don't know who Jesus is. So why, did, why then did he say, be sober, be vigilant for your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking who be made of our. We have Jesus the lion of Judah and we have Satan the roaring lion. So if the lion presents itself, if you're sober, you'll know which lion is the right one. Amen. If you are drunk with false Bibles and false doctrine, you're going to get devoured by the wrong lion. Okay? So he says then, they've erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. Err in vision. There's errors in every translation, is what they say. There's errors in all the Bibles. They're drunk. They have a drunken spirit. They've been drinking at Babylon's table. For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness, that there is no place clean. And what do dogs do with vomit? Look it up. So then he said, whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he... God's looking for people that want to know the truth. They're tired of being lied to, yeah. like I was. Yeah. Tired of being lied to. I want to know the truth, God. Don't varnish it for me. Just tell it to me straight. So then he says, verse 11, for with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. Right here you have a prophecy. First of all, with stammering lips, I believe, is Moses. With stammering lips will he speak to this people. Moses spoke as a stammerer. He was hard of speech. With another tongue will he speak to this people. So it's, here's, it's, here's what's interesting. From Hebrews and from Paul's writings, we find that since there was a change, since there was a change in the tribe that the priesthood came from, there must of necessity be a change also in the law. Yeah. Christ wasn't a Levite. So he was not a high priest after the order of Aaron. He was a high priest. He was born of Judah. He's a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, a heavenly order of priests. Yeah. So a change in the priesthood requires a change in the law. And since there is a change in the law, there is also a change of the language. Yeah. God says, I spoke to you in Hebrew, and you didn't believe me. So now I'm going to speak to you in another tongue. That's right. So now I have the New Testament not written in Hebrew. It's Greek. Yeah. Amen. Uh, get this. It's a language that actually has vowels in it. 
Hebrew is all consonants, and that's stopping the lips and the teeth and the tongue. That's what consonants do. They all stop the breath. Vowels are what lets the breath out. A, E, I, O, U. You hear that? It's got the breath in it. The letter, the spirit giveth life, but the letter killeth. Isn't that cool? Okay, so now we have a change in the language because God said that. Stammering lips and another tongue. So God's already said, as a prophecy, I'm going to speak in another language. He's already said that. So now let's go to Acts chapter 2. Yeah. Did he do that? Yeah. Sure he did. And was it... Was it... No. Did they understand everything they were saying? Yeah. Sure they did. And and listen, I've had some I've had some good Pentecostal pastors talk to me. And I love them. And they say, Mike, when we speak in tongues, we do it according to 1 Corinthians. We follow the word of God. Okay, I'm not gonna get into it with you. They're King James people. I believe they love the Lord, and I just I'm gonna let let God deal with it. If they're God's people, God, God knows how to straighten us all out. Amen. Amen. So on the day of Pentecost, um, verse 4, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues or languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. So here's a lot of, a lot of conservative good pastors will say, we use the King James, but I just can't see yet that a translation can be inspired like the original languages. And this is, this is I ask God this question. God, how do I answer this question? And God helped me answer this question. It just made sense. So when I read Isaiah 28, 11, with stammering lips and another tongue will I speak to this people, okay? And so then on the day of Pentecost, we, we have it clearly told us that they were not speaking in gibberish tongues, babble tongues, anything like that. They were not speaking Klingon or anything. Yeah. They were speaking the languages of the people who were standing there. Verse 7, they were all, they heard, verse 6, this was noised abroad, multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Yeah. And they marveled and amazed, uh, were, were amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians, they were speaking Parthians and Medes, and they were speaking Elamite, and they were speaking Mesopotamian and Judah and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, and they were speaking Phrygian and Pamphylian and Egyptian and Libyan and Cyrenian and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues, our language, the wonderful works of God. Amen. So can God translate his word. Amen. He did already. Amen. And he did a good job, didn't he? 3,000 people got saved that day. Amen. Why? Because it was given to him in Greek? No. Given to him in Hebrew? No. It was in the language that they were born in. Amen. Now watch this. Go to 1 Corinthians 14. And here's, here's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw you a curveball, okay? And I'm going to see if you can hit it out of the park. This will be your turn to be smart, like I am, okay? <laughs> Aren't you glad you know me? <laughs> I mean, just, I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, everything I've been through, I like to come down and have laughs with people, okay? Now, uh, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 14, that's what I said, right? Mike, listen to your own preaching, crying out loud. 
First Corinthians 14, the most misunderstood chapter in probably the whole Bible. So in 14, 1 Corinthians 14, uh, let's see here. Paul's laying out a case for the fact that if you don't understand it, what good does it do? Because he says, verse 6, Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you? Except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine. And even things, and see, that, that's what thrilled me because the first time I went to Kenya, I just didn't understand that they speak English. They just don't understand my accent. And then it dawned on me. Somebody had to be next to me speaking what I was speaking, either in Swahili or in English, in their accent, so they could, they could understand it. Sometimes when my son-in-law gets talking real fast, I'm just going... <laughs> Say that again, Michael. Real slow. Real slow. Talk like a hillbilly. He does. He does a perfect hillbilly. From, you ought to see a Kenya from hillbilly, okay? He does it. Hey, I'm going out to the racetrack tomorrow night. He does that. Um, so, how can they understand except they know it and hear it in their own language? And Paul says, verse 7, Even things without life-giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? If they tune the piano strings to the same note, then how could you play Amazing Grace, how sweet this sound? The way some of you sing it, with one note, okay? <laughs> um, for the trumpet, uh, think about this now. A trumpet's going to sound, we're going to go in the air, amen? amen? But if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So likewise, ye except ye uttered by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. Yeah. Now, look at verse, um, where is it I'm looking for? Where he quotes Isaiah 28. Yeah, verse 21. In the law it is written, now here's your curveball right here. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. Now we just read Isaiah 28, 11, yeah. where Paul's quoting from. But is there a difference the way Paul said it versus the way Isaiah said it? Yeah. So how do you reconcile that? How do you reconcile that? When you look at the writing above the cross in each of the four Gospels, in each of the four Gospels, it's different. Yeah. One of them says, this is the King of the Jews. One of them says, this is Jesus of Nazareth. Another one says, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. I found out that if you put all of them together, you get the entire complete message that was written above the cross. Yeah. No mistakes. Amen. No mistakes. God just wants you to read the whole thing. Amen. Amen. So, think of the typology of the body. You have two ears on the side of your head. Why? Because God has given us with that the ability to tell which direction a sound is coming from, hasn't he? Yeah. We, you, if we hear it more in this ear than this ear, our bod body naturally reacts to it. You've seen deer and rabbits and stuff like that. Cows turn their ear. Yeah. Okay. Why did God put the eyes of horses and certain other animals on the side of their head? And so they could see what's behind them too and see what's ahead of them and what's beside because they have predators after them, right? Yeah. God's given us two eyes. He's given us two testaments. And most of the time, when the New Testament quotes the Old Testament, it doesn't quote it exactly 100% the way it's written in the Old Testament. Now, everybody do this. Everybody do this. You're not doing it. Put your finger right out in front of your two eyes like this. 
Let me get my phone. I want to take a picture of you. Hang on a second. No, I'm just kidding. You have two eyes, right? And if you're staring at your finger, it kind of looks like there's two fingers. If you look beyond your finger, it looks like there's two fingers, right? This eye seeing from this direction and this eye seeing from this direction is how God gave us depth perception. Three dimensions. If a person only has one eye, everything looks like it does on a TV screen. You can kind of tell depth by things being small or whatever, but you can't see the depth because it requires the two eyes looking at it from two slightly different angles. That's what you have with the Bible. You have the Old Testament eye looking at it one way, the New Testament eye looking at it from a different way, and you're getting two different perspectives on the exact same thing. Does that make sense to everybody? God is actually giving you biblical depth perception by doing it that way. Isn't that neat? So he says, with men of other tongues and other voices, will I speak to this people? Whereas in the Old Testament, he just said, with another tongue, one tongue. But now Paul, who by inspiration of the Holy Ghost, has said, God told me to say this, so I'm going to say it, other tongues, plural. Right. Which means God, I don't believe God just speaks King James English either. Amen. I believe God has spoken his word to people of all kinds of languages Amen. throughout the centuries. But here's just an opinion of mine. Just the way Greek was in the days of Jesus, it was the worldwide language. So was English. You go anywhere in the world. There's English everywhere. Which then gives those people an opportunity to read the Word of God. Amen. The King James Bible. So, now watch this. I'm almost done. Uh, with men of other tongues and other voices will I speak to this people. Yet for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. So now, he says this. Verse 27, he's going to lay down a rule that not even God will break. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, if you speak Hebrew, raise your hand. No? Does anybody here speak Aramaic? No. Does anybody here speak Greek? No. Those languages to you not only are unknown, you don't even know what the letters are. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So if any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most three. Now think about what I just said. The Bible was written in three unknown tongues, Hebrew, Aramaic and Greek. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most three, and then let one interpret or translate. So the preacher that says, I'd like to get all the English translations out and compare them all. They just violated 1 Corinthians 14. Yeah. It would be like if, if, if you guys spoke in tongues and a man stood up and spoke in tongues and somebody else stood up and spoke in tongues and, and the pastor said, okay, we need an interpretation and 14 of you guys got up and they all give a different interpretation of what they said, that's out of order. Yeah, amen. Right. And God did not give that, did he? No. That's how you know the Holy Ghost did not do, did not do that. So God has already given us one interpretation of these three unknown languages that our Bible was written in. Isn't that good enough for you? Amen. Who wrote your Bible? God. Who preserved your Bible? God. Who translated your Bible? God, God did. Father, bless your word today. 
teach us great and mighty things that we know not. Father, we all have friends, family members, pastor friends, that they've just been told one way and that's, that's it. Or the other preachers in their denomination, they've all done it this way, so they feel like they've got to stay in with them like I was going to do until God, you called me out. And they just feel like they've got to stay with the other guys in order to stay in fellowship because it's hard to find good fellowship. Father, those are the ones we're praying for today. That, God, you would show them the light the way you showed us the light. And, God, we didn't deserve it, but you gave it to us anyway. And we know that nobody else deserves it, but, Father, we love them. These are our family members. These are our friends. These are our parents, our children, our grandchildren. These are our pastors. And they're good men. They've just been told the wrong way. Father, would you lighten their eyes? Would you say to them what you said to me? Let there be light. And there will be light. So, Father, I pray that you bless this word, each and every man, woman, and child here. Because we're going to need it. Things are going to happen in this world, and we're going to need to know that our Bible is 100% sure when it tells us what is happening in our world. Thank you, God, for preserving it and keeping it for us and not lying to us because I got tired of being lied to, God. I got tired of lying myself. Thank you, God, for correcting me. Bless your word. Bless Brother Reg and these good people. I love them. Lord, give us a good lunch. Give us a good day, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.